Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer Taviv here from Health Means, and we are excited to bring you our next interview in our series Health Means Live Chats, where we interview Health Means health experts and dive deeper into their talks to gather the goldmine of information that is there to help us achieve our goals. Today, we've got Maureen Gary, and we're going to be talking about her talk, Top Shelf Nutrients for Fueling the Female Brain, where she had guest Max Lugavere. Maureen Gary is a certified nutrition coach, athletic trainer, and media host, specifically focusing on building lifestyle, lifestyles that support greater cognitive clarity for women over 50. Maureen has been doing this for over 10 years and has a background in medical research. Maureen, welcome. Thanks, Jennifer. Good to be here. Yes, we're very happy to have you. Uh, I want to start today by asking you if you can tell us a little bit about what it is exactly that you do and how you ended up on that path. This path that I'm on, I did not expect to be on, but I am here in this specifically focusing on brain health because my mom has Alzheimer's mm. and that is very motivating for me, not only because you know, I wanted to help her, but really I knew that was too late for her and I want to do what I can to not get it myself. Yeah. So I really looked into that deeply and, you know, so encouraging. There is so much we can do, but I found every time I would tell one of my friends about it, they'd say, I didn't know that. You know, and I thought, well, obviously this needs to get out. People don't know how much they can do. Mm -hmm. So I started hosting summits and I've done three so far, the female yeah. brain summit. I've done three and that's what this talk is from. Yeah. And it's all about all of the things that we can do just with our lifestyles and some are medical interventions like hormones and things like that. But we really have so much power to take care of our brains now so that we don't decay and slide down that path of cognitive decline that ultimately could end up in Alzheimer's. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. my real motivation. I started way, way back though in college, I got an athletic training degree. Wow. I was really into, you know, like being healthy and I wanted to learn how to stay that way. And uh, so I started working with athletes, but, uh, you know, training rooms and ultimately decided that wasn't quite the path for me. I wanted something a little more. And I ended up in clinical research for medical devices, which was super cool. Very fascinating field. I loved that career. Um, and I, I mostly work with cardiovascular devices. It's okay. a lot of vents, things like that. And, um, after I moved, I, I would live in Hawaii now. And so after I moved, you know, this is kind of a place where there's not a lot of clinical research. So I said, well, gosh, I got to, you know, I'm going to get back to my roots where I really want to be, where I want to prevent rather than treat because, you know, we were treating the d disease that had already been, you know, there causing yeah. problems. So uh, that's when I started to think, ah, you know, I'm going to share this whole thing about fitness and health, health for your brain, you mm. know, not just the body. Yeah, and that's what got me here. That's great. That's such a um, such an interesting journey. And one of the one of the things that really stuck out for me, um, and you know, I have personally been affected by Alzheimer's. You know, I have I have family members, um, and I think that probably nearly everyone watching this will, can yeah. relate to that. It's really prevalent. And yeah. one of the things that really stood out for me, I, and I remember thinking this a number of times while I was watching the talk that you had with Max mm -hmm. Lugavere, is, gosh, this is really simple. You yes. Know, and <laughs> kept, that kept playing in my mind because I, I sort of sat down to watch it and to prepare to have this conversation with you thinking, this is an area that I don't know a lot about. This is not an area that I've done a lot of research in, and I'm going to be hearing very complex things. And it's kind of an intimidating area. We think of Alzheimer's and cognitive health the brain, you know, sort of is the final frontier is this really intimidating area. Yeah. And, and, and as you, and we will in the course of today's talk, review some of those major pieces um, of, of nutritional advice and approaches that people can take. Um, mm -hmm. As I was watching it, it was like, oh yeah, I can just do that now. There's right. no, you know, or I can very easily call, you know, my, my father or, or some of the, um, members of, of my family who are unfortunately closer to the age where where our family members have had the diagnoses and say, please just start doing this today. It's not even a huge change in your routine. Yeah. 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 So this is the thing that I, that I really 
look at this because I've dealt with, you know, like as a coach, yeah. trying to get people to make these changes. It seems so simple, but when you really try to implement having a diet that keeps your blood glucose level stable, yeah. Yeah. And you have a person who just lives on these carbohydrates and sugars all the time. Yeah. And they're so used to that. That's a huge change. Yeah. It's not so simple, but it's really when the rubber meets the road, it's a lot to work through for some yeah. people. That's true. That's a good point. It's, it's yeah. a good point. It is, but it's not, um, it's sort of it as, as unavailable and as impenetrable as, as I feel like we all yeah. thought that it was. It's not some bizarre mix of all these, you know, special nootropics that people right. come out with now, right? And this brain supplements and it's not, you don't have to get on those for the rest of your life. Yeah. You know, maybe they will help in some instances, but it's really just core things that are good for what's below the neck, right? It all goes yeah. above the neck too. Yeah. yeah. And then there are some special things we want to take care of as well, but yes, you yeah. know, it's kind of like the old saying, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. Yeah. Good diet for your heart, probably right. good for your brain. Right. It's a whole body, right? We don't have yeah. to just focus on one thing. We don't have to compartmentalize. That's so true. Right. Yeah. So um, I want to, I want to dive right in. And then I do want to hear, let's we'll make sure to remember to circle back to that because I do want to hear what it is like for you when you're talking to, you said that you work with a population of over 50 and what mm -hmm. are some of those unique challenges that we're facing at that age and, and, um, and how do we work through them and how do we shift those lifestyles? Cause that's a really, that's a really important piece of it, but let's yeah. start with the, with the basics. Um, so, so the first question that I have for you is, and, and, you know, if you can kind of give us a rundown, there seem to be two clear paths, the foods that, that impact negatively upon our neurological function and the foods that impact positively that improve our neurological function. Can you give us a rundown of what those are? Yeah. So I mentioned earlier the carbohydrate, sugar, up and down, up and down, blood swings, sugar, yeah. blood glucose swings. Yeah. That is super, super critical. Hmm. Because what ends up happening, just like your body, your brain becomes resistant to insulin as well. Mm. And, you know, the glucose, insulin is what allows the glucose to, you know, the receptors to open up and allow the glucose in. And so if you do not have sensitivity to that, your brain is literally starving, not getting glucose. Mm. It's just like below your neck, you know. I mean, I always say that because it's where people sort of draw the line. They always think this is a mystery up here. Yeah. Like, I don't yeah. get it. I don't know what to do. And I don't, can't do, yeah. right? They feel like they can't do anything. But if you keep your blood sugar stable, you're going to keep the sensitivity to insulin higher. And then your brain cells, you know, the neurons and the supporting glial cells and all those other kinds of cells. There's a bunch of cells in there that aren't neurons. Okay. They're all going to get more energy. They're all going to be more nourished. And when you nourish them, they're going to be healthier. You know, if you starve the poor things, they're not going to be healthy. So what, when you're talking about starving those cells, are you talking about not eating glucose? Or you're talking about eating what, give me an idea of what that, what is it? What is a diet that starves those important cells? So if you get to the place where you are insulin resistant, okay, which is caused by that diet that makes your blood sugar go up and down like this, yeah. right? If you're a snacking candy person, like you have a really high carb, something or other, you're not very good in getting much protein in yourself, yeah. but you do get a lot of carbs in then you are naturally creating this cycle of really high and really low glucose, you know? Okay. So the glucose goes up and then your insulin rushes in and it takes it down again. And then you get another snack and the glucose goes up and your insulin rushes in. And that, that episode of your insulin rushing in, every time you do this massive flood of insulin, your cells go, oh, too much, turn off, mm. you know, it develops over time. But right. that's what ends up happening when you can do this thing for years then your insulin becomes not effective anymore. And that's what is pre-diabetes, diabetes. And I don't want to get too technical, but this is a continuum. Right. And like when you're declared to have diabetes, you've already been on that path, getting worse and worse and worse for years. Mm. And so there's even a phase before pre-diabetes that people don't even talk about, doctors don't even test for unless you go to a functional medicine doctor, mm. which is where your insulin is just cranky because it's trying to deal with these spikes. And wow. so you can't detect it in your blood glucose because your insulin is cranked so high that it's actually doing its job, but you're way overtaxed in the system. 
Wow. So that's why people that go, oh, well, you know, my glucose is fine. They feel like they're fine, but they might be in that stage that's just, you know, before the problem comes. Right. Yeah. 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 The doctor says you have prediabetes or, right. you know. Yeah. Right. And the A1C can be normal during that period of time. Yes. Yes. Those yes. tests that they normally do are normal. Wow. You have to go to the one like a glucose tolerance test where they do a challenge and they measure what your, or your insulin, where they right. measure your actual insulin. Yeah. Right. So what, so what people do, now this is the coping mechanism. If you're actually beyond, if you have insulin resistance in your brain and you're not getting the energy from glucose, which is the preferred source, it's super easy to get, you know, flows right into your brain cells. Okay. Um, although I, I have to take that back because I've, uh, there's conversation that it is ketones are preferred. Right. But anyway. Right. I was going to ask. One works. Okay. So yeah. your neuron needs one or the other. Okay. <laughs> and, um, so if you, if you're insulin insensitive, then you've got to give it ketones because it needs fuel. So that's why this ketogenic diet is so helpful for people yeah. who have neurological impairment. If you're feeling mm. foggy, if you're down that road for, you know, mild cognitive impairment or even being dosed, diagnosed with Alzheimer's, yeah, ketogenic diets are helpful because that is fuel for your brain. And at that point, you're not taking it from the glucose. You're not getting it in. Right. You gotta no. get it in. It's like, give up on that system. Let's go to the ketone system. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it seems like it does work for a lot of people, but the goal is to yeah. never have to end up in the, at that point. That is absolutely right. Because we're really flex, you know, we can do either or if we're healthy, you know, throw glucose. Yeah, good. Throw ketones. Good. We can use anything. But yeah. when you shut down one system, you're then you're stuck with the other and you got to use, use that one. Yeah. 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 Wow. And and you use such an important word here. And I think that the public consciousness about this is starting to shift, certainly within the health means audience, you use the word continuum. And, um, and, you know, I, I know that 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we did not think of Alzheimer's as being on some kind of metabolic continuum. We just yes. thought of it as its own thing and diabetes as its own thing and, you know, not related. And the fact that it is a continuum, you know, when you get over sort of the vastness of that, it's a hopeful thing. It's a thing yes. that, you can, that there's a long, slow burn period of time that you can get in there and interrupt that process. Yeah. Shift things back. Yeah. And that concept is really important when you get women who are sort of like, well, you know, I'm sort of forgetful, but that's normal. Right. It's like, no, that's the beginning of the slide. You know, you just, mm -hmm. just don't want to go that direction. You want to pull back. You want to feel like sharp all the time. I always tell right. people to be sharp, you know, because I think when you stay sharp, you could, you can, you can actually stay sharp. You know, you don't want to go. So there's three levels that doctors will diagnose. There's a subjective cognitive impairment, which is like the way over, you know, the very beginnings. Like I'm just feeling a little foggy. I'm just not feeling as, as good as I used to, but that's eh, okay. Then you get to, and nobody can test that. It's like that just is your it's subjective. That, sense that you have about yourself. Right. Yeah. 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 I have a six year old. So you're describing. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> <laughs> it's like pregnancy brain, right? Or, yeah, yeah. Or, or they call it menopause brain too, just foggy. Yeah. Then there's the mild cognitive impairment, MCI, which is a diagnosed thing. The doctor will write on your chart if you do poorly on a test. And then that's when they start to say, well, and honestly, with my mom, MCI, it's no big, it's mild. You know, like they treat it as no big deal. They don't know what to do about it anyway. They just right. write that down and they say, well, let me know how you feel. You know, it's, it's really nothing. They do nothing. Hmm. And then you continue down that path and it's like, Oh wow. Look, you have Alzheimer's, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's so just a slide in the wrong direction. So you, you can slide it back. Really. You can, you can repair neurons. You can, you can become more sensitive, sensitive to insulin. You know, things can grow back with the right lifestyle. You can grow your brain again, which and, is, a, which is a 180 type of message from what we were hearing. Even five years ago. Yes, even five years ago, like about when I started looking at this and started seeing that, yeah, there's hope and, you know, that I didn't know. And the more I read and then I told my friends, they didn't know. It's really new. This yeah. is very new stuff. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So the four, the, not four, um, the top foods that we should be eating. So we should be eating, definitely need to get DHA. Okay. okay so the, the fish marine oil, right? Okay. 
And vegetarians and vegans don't want to eat that typically. Well, right. vegans, of course, not, but vegetarians many times um, won't eat the marine oils. And so they'll have the plant precursor, which is ALA, and that will convert into DHA. But the problem that happens, and I should just, I'm going to jump to the end because I know you said, you know, we'll talk about the over 50, but after you get past menopause, yeah. the enzymes that help you convert to that active form, that DHA that you actually need for your brain mm. are really downregulated. We start to have far less efficient conversion mm. and it's pretty darn inefficient anyway in the beginning, Right. but it gets even less so after menopause. Mm. So you know, it's it's one of those things. I understand there's ethically people want to avoid having any animals, but yeah. it is super important if you are choosing that to definitely get algae oil or some, you know, kind of thing that can get, you know, algae oil is the best, really. To yeah, that's, a vegan, that. that's a vegan. Yeah, for vegan. Yeah. Yeah, because we get that question a lot. Um, so yeah. For sure. Yeah. And that's... Okay, so DHA. Yeah. You want to have lots and lots and lots of plants and colorful, colorful produce, you know, not as much fruit. Don't like go, oh, I'm just going to gorge on blueberries because blueberries are brain food. You know, you got vegetables <laughs> and lots of colors. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because so the vegetables are something that is a pro, it's not a probiotic, it's a prebiotic. Yeah. Do you know the difference? Okay, so for the audience, if they might not be familiar, the prebiotics are the things that feed the gut microbiome. Yeah. And so that gut microbiome, when you feed it all that fiber that comes from those plants, then it will start to create some beneficial byproducts. You know, yeah. short chain fatty acids and it'll produce, it produces hormones, you know, serotonin, a huge amount of serotonin, dopamine. It just produces all kinds of great hormones. Yeah. So what we want to do is keep our gut microbiome really happy. And that comes from lots of different types of fibers. And those fibers come in plants. So we have to eat a lot of plants. Okay. Yeah. And, and then the other, the pre, sorry, the, I keep flopping them. The probiotics are the, the fermented things yeah. like, you know, kefir and kimchi and yogurt and uh, kombucha, that kind okay. of thing. Okay. So that feeds, that's more of a going through. It kind of passes through. And as it passes through your intestines, then it starts to give signals to your systems, you know, sort of like a signaling uh, bunch of microorganisms. They don't actually colonize, but they do alter things as they pass through. So it will have your genome expressing differently just okay. by the presence. Yeah. Interesting. So do you, would you say that it's generally not necessary to take like an over-the-counter probiotic, a processed probiotic? Do you think it's more important to get those probiotics from fermented foods or or what's your take on that? Usually there's much higher potency in the fermented foods. Okay. However, if you only rely on one strain of, say, if you just love Chobani yogurt and you just go for Chobani plain Greek yogurt all the time, okay, okay. <laughs> they're going to have their set number of very specific microorganisms. They're going to culture because they want a product that's consistent. Every single time it has to be the same. Yeah. So that's what you're going to give to your gut is those, and they're usually just four different things. Hmm. What I love is to do a variety of things. And if you go and create your own kefir, and some people don't want to do it, but this is what I would recommend if you really okay. want to do it. Okay. Um, you can get kefir grains and you create your own kefir, which is so simple. It's okay. killer simple. You stick a quart of milk on the counter and you let it sit there. It's really so simple. Okay. But anyway, you can get like, dozens of different types of microbes in there you know you'll get yeast and don't freak out if i say yeast but there are good it's it's all the whole microbiome oh, is very are, complex right, right all our listeners are like no <laughs> we just no, didn't yeast, no, yeast. <laughs> no but you get fungi yeast you'll get other bacteria you'll okay. get a whole bunch and so your variety is the name of the game too okay you know, different kinds of things that are going to colonize Okay, will you give us uh, your recipe for kefir when we're done? Well, yeah, it's super simple. You order the grains online from, I can give you the, I don't even remember, Dom's, Dom's Kefir Insight. Okay. I had, literally, I had one before I moved to Hawaii. I, I 
left in the luggage too long this last time and it died. But I had one batch literally going for over 10 years. Wow. One batch. Okay. I just kept moving it to another container, add some more milk. Oh, that's good. Move a little to another container, add some more milk. It yeah. just keeps going. It's like, it's like a forest, you know, you just water it with milk. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, great. So DHA, mm. fermented foods, uh, mm. probiotic rich foods, and those prebiotic rich uh, fibers that are in our vegetables, not so much the fruits. Well, the fruits, I just say to stay away because people love to overdo the sugar on them. Yeah. There's a lot of fiber in whole fruits too. Yeah. But the fact that the fruits and vegetables are in the same category, people kind of like go, oh, it's all the same. But okay. it's not actually in your body. Okay. So I say just like really focus on the, the fiber of the vegetables because the fruits are kind of going to take care of themselves unless you're keto and then you're really afraid of sugar and fruit. Okay. But most people are not. And so most people will say, yeah, I'll go eat, you know, right. some berries and an apple and, you know, have an orange and that kind of thing. And those are all good. Right. But they're not enough. They're not adequate. For they're not adequate. Then you have to add in a whole bunch, you know, add in beans, which I know is not paleo, but I believe in beans. <laughs> We're because, a birth community. I'm yes, sure we are. We have many, many different ways of looking at things. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So the foods that we should definitely avoid. So you said the carbohydrates. Um, what, Simple it, sugars. Okay. So the carbohydrates are different forms. Like they're all the same thing. Like fruits and vegetables are in one gang. Okay, yeah. carbohydrates come in one gang, and that comes anywhere from, you know, a fresh, organic, sweet potato jug right out of the ground to, like, that red, fake sugar thing that you get in your Halloween basket. Okay. <laughs> Those are all carbohydrates. Stuff I throw out every year while my kids tell me I'm the worst mother ever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> many years of buying candy for me. And then when they said, I don't want to sell you my candy anymore, I'm like, Okay. okay, now I got into the strategy. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, okay, so what do you do? What do you do with okay. that beautiful organic sweet potato? Yeah, so you can eat that whole organic sweet potato thing. That's great. Okay. Don't eat that sugar crap. I mean, yeah. the, the sodas, the sugars, the process, like the flowers. Yeah. Flowers are pre digested, like the grain or whatever you made the flour out of over here. It, it's ground up and in the tiniest little of particles yeah. and so it goes into your bloodstream very quickly because you don't have that time delay of actually having to digest it like break it all up in your mouth and have your gut chew you know and all that kind of thing so there's this there's this process in the middle that's lost and so then that it, it goes right into your bloodstream very quickly and that's why they like people will say well bread is just as bad as candy it's because of the rate that you can take up this this and what about the what about the gluten-free breads that are made from things like sorghum or I, I know that we want to stay away from things made from like white potato or tapioca but then there are also these like quinoa and grasses and stuff like that what do we do with that is that okay yeah so here i i look at it as a holistic picture right so if you have a piece of gluten-free say you're like a gluten-free person and you want to have a piece of toast and you put in your toast and you go okay now what do i do to think about my blood sugar you want to put on some, you want to combine that in your, in your intestines, like whatever goes down together is going to get digested together, right? Okay. So you want to combine that with something that's going to slow that ab absorption down. Okay. And that's either fat or protein. Yeah. Both of those slow down because both of those are harder to break down. It's a whole process of breaking down. Yeah. And so if you crowd, you know, this big ball of food coming down, right? And you've got things that are super hard to digest, you know, things yeah. to break down. And then you've got amongst that, you've got little particles of the super fast, like that bread. Yeah. You know? In the grand scheme of things, you're not going to get a massive spike because you're sort of, it's like a traffic jam, right? You know? As opposed to just zoom one fast motorcycle down the highway. You know? Okay. All right. That's good. That's good advice. Um, okay. So, so the next question that we have for you, um, again, it's so, so basic, but so interesting and such, such an important thing. Um, is it okay to skip meals? Is it okay? I think we get a lot of conflicting information about, you know, eat a full, I, I did once the paleo, not once, more than once, the AIP paleo <laughs> protocol. And, um, and it was like these massive country breakfasts. Uh -huh. 
was like a, you must eat this amount of food every morning. And I'm a like coffee on the way to work kind of person. Um, and then very small dinners. And then I've done, I, I know other people say it other ways. Other people say eat every two hours for your blood sugar. What is it okay to skip? What's the cycle that people should be looking at or does it not matter at all? It really matters. And I'll tell you what I know, what I believe at this point, based on what I, I've heard that the research wise, right? Okay. Um, so how, I don't know if the people on this call have heard of autophagy. Is that something that comes up regularly in the calls? It's not a word that I've heard before. What is it? Okay. Autophagy, which basically means your body auto, you yourself and phage is eat. So okay. it's like your body is eating itself. And it's not eating in a bad way. It's eating in a good way. Okay. So what you want to do is you want to create opportunities for your body to go into this state hmm. of, of performing autophagy. And usually that happens when you're not digesting. So what you want to do is you want to gang your food together. You want to have a meal. You want to run through that digestive process. And then you want to give your body a rest so that it has a chance to then clean up the mess, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I believe the paleo people want you to start early with the big food yeah, and then slow down and, and stop. And you wanted a, a shorter eating window, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was, I yeah. do like that kind of intermittent fasting and I've yes. seen people talk about where you should stop eating at like 8 PM yes. and you're going 12 to 15 hours. Not yes. Eating. That is why the okay. autophagy is why, because you've got to stop digesting. You've got to give your digestive system off time off okay now we're going to do other jobs okay. now our body's function is to clean up and to get ready and get rid of old so the new can come we can build new but if you're constantly feeding and feeding and feeding and and this is shocking to me but most people are almost feeding from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed yeah that's that's not good for you and you never get the chance to clean the crap out you clean the crap out of your brain you clean the crap out of the rest of your body, you know, it's just all the cells. I mean, I'm not just saying digestive system. Yeah. I'm saying clean your skin, clean everything, you know, dead goes away. So the digest, the digestive process gets in the way of being able to, to do that. It takes a lot of energy away. It like takes focus away. Yeah. So that's so what's found is when you stop dealing with food, like that's, you have a big meal, you don't eat, you have a meal, you don't eat, have a meal. And then you have that long overnight fast. Yeah. And for women, women usually have a shorter fasting window than men. Yeah. Because they were just more sensitized just because of our physiology. Because we're used to carrying the babies and we yeah. have, have to have food more often than men do because yeah. they're not as sensitive. So women, 12 to 14 hours. Okay. okay. So that's simple. I mean, if you stop at seven at night yeah. and you don't eat until seven in the morning, that's that's 12 hours, yeah. you know, yeah. and if you stop at six at night and you don't eat until eight in the morning, you know, I mean, that's not so hard to do. Right. No, it's not. Yeah. And yes, I mean, I'm usually forgetting to eat anyway. So it's really oh, well, lucky you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, um, that's great. And it was something that Max talked about on the talk with you, this sort of overnight intermittent fasting. Yes. Eat. And that's very big right now. Um, Walter, yeah. Walter Longo is a really great researcher at USC and he's doing a lot of research on this fasting and, and he's even got a fasting mimicking diet because fasting is so hard for people, you know, yeah. true fasting for days. Yeah. But fasting, this whole process of autophagy is becoming so well known now in yeah. the, the research community for being very, very helpful for getting rid of a lot of disease, you know, yeah. because of that cleaning up, because of that getting rid of old and weak cells. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was uh, actually speaking with a member of our community uh, yesterday. We do uh, get, get, they reach out to us on social media and through customer service and stuff. And they were saying that um, the, uh, that their doctor, a regular old endocrinologist, just a conventional medicine practitioner, um, had them start an intermittent fasting protocol to deal with an autoimmune condition. Wow. Like, you know, and the, yay, you know, sort of secretly <laughs> like, that's amazing. And, and, yes. and it's very effective. It's been really effective yes. for him. So it's definitely working its way into the mainstream. Excellent. Um, I'm glad to hear that. It is. It totally yeah. is. So, um, so I want to, want to make sure to get through all of our questions. I think we could talk yeah. about this all night long, uh, being mindful of everyone's time. Uh, coffee. We're talking about yeah. energy. 
after you were talking about clarity, uh, and yes. everyone at Health Means knows that I'm there at our morning meeting with this giant tub of steaming hot organic coffee. Um, <laughs> what? What? Tell me. Tell me the good news. Yeah, I, I'm leading. I don't know anything. She's. she's telling me. <laughs> I want good news. Because <laughs> <laughs> it does. There's good. Bad. There's good. Okay. And, there, and there's bad. It's a double-edged sword. This coffee. Okay. Unfortunately, we can't just like all dive into you know having big coffees all day. Um, because, okay, so coffee and caffeine has actually been shown. The caffeine itself okay. has been shown to be a neurostimulant, right? Yeah. It makes you clearer and sharper and everything. Yeah. The other components of the coffee are very good antioxidants. Mm. So there's a lot in decaf coffee and regular coffee, just the coffee itself. It's a very yeah. complex plant and it's got lots of great compounds. Okay. Okay. So the double edged sword of the caffeine thing. Okay. is the energy and the energy that um, you get from it when you're not a regular coffee drinker is awesome. Mm -hmm. And then the regular are the, if you're a regular coffee drinker, the energy you get is not awesome anymore. It is getting you back to normal. Yeah. Has your brain actually grows more receptors because caffeine will, will block adenosine receptors. And so you got all this adenosine running around and you're all feeling really good. And the brain's like, wait, we're not getting our, our adenosine receptors filled. We're going to make more of them. And so then your brain adapts to that caffeine stimulus. Mm. And therefore, if you don't have the caffeine, I know it's such a bummer. And you're watching my whole face. <laughs> you know, me too. Me too. Because when I, honestly, when I started on this whole brain thing, I wasn't a coffee drinker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Coffee's good for my brain. Okay, I'm going to start drinking coffee. I did not like coffee. I made myself drink coffee for my brain. And then I start looking into farther how the brain reacts to this adenosine thing. I'm like, okay, so now I got to stop drinking coffee and weaning yourself. I'm actually measuring, I'm doing instant coffee. Now I'm measuring my little instant coffee so that I can wean myself down because I don't want to crash for a week, Yeah. which if I just went cold turkey, I would. Yes. But so the, the cycle that you can do, once you get yourself weaned down to not having coffee and you have good energy with no coffee, you go like a few days, a week, a couple weeks, then you do coffee again. Oh, it's awesome. You yeah, feel yeah. so energized, right? So you yeah. have the sensitivity yeah. again. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So that's that's the good and the bad and the ugly. <laughs> and uh, Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. It's a trade off. Thank you for answering that. I'll process it after. I know. Yeah. I know. You don't have to do anything with it now except process. Okay. You can help. You still have your coffee. Okay. <laughs> I tried you. cold turkey before too. And it's just ugly. Yeah. 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 No, it's not good. It's not good. <laughs> um, okay. So the last question that we, that we have for you tonight is about, an, yeah, we talked about it a little bit earlier in the call. Um, talking about menopause, talking about post menopause, talking about how, how things shift for us, how nutrients shift for us, uh, how estrogen impacts things and the changing levels of the hormones in our body and what yeah. role in particular this plays in our cognitive health. Yes. So that's a, it's a big, big impact. And that's yeah. why um, they theorize that that's why two thirds of the uh, cases of Alzheimer's are women because mm. of this huge role of estrogen protecting the brain. And then when it goes away, then we're vulnerable. So I mentioned that the, the enzymes for converting the ALA to the DHA go down. Yeah. Also what happens is that we at menopause become much more sensitive to cortisol mm. and chronic cortisol. If you're just always flying around, you know, on high gear from cortisol, you're just stress, stress, go, 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 go. That sim symptom, that signal to your brain will actually shrink down the memory center, the hippocampus in your brain. It is the hippocampus is sensitive to cortisol huh. and the women, women, are, you know, uh, past menopause are more sensitive to cortisol. So that stress will make our brains shrink. Wow. I know it's horrible, but the good news is there are so many things we can do to de-stress, right? I mean, meditation is becoming so big these days. That's one way. If you're not a meditator, exercise is an awesome way to de-stress. Yeah. You know, a lot of people pray. That's kind of a meditation, but it's not. You know, it's it's a God-focused meditation, but it's still a meditation. You're calming yeah. yourself, you know? Absolutely. So any way that you that works for your life, yeah, bring that stress down 
is so important after so you're, so you're saying that stress plays a disproportionately negative role after menopause more so than before yeah it because it, because that cortisol is such an insult to the hippocampus wow that is a sensitive area but the good news is and i'll bring in exercise very briefly because the hippocampus is also the great place where you can increase BDN, BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Okay. That goes up with exercise, and that grows the hippocampus especially. It'll grow the frontal cortex too. It'll okay. grow a couple of the areas in your brain, but really sensitive to the memory center. Mm. Uh, the memory center is really sensitive to the uh, exercise and growing. Okay. So they have great tools now to actually visualize this. And they can see, you know, size-wise, they'll measure it, all computerized, measure to see how many, what the volume is of pre- and post-exercise and all these interventions, and they're growing their brains. They're actually, yeah. these interventions are growing people's brains. Now, define exercise. Are we talking about training for a marathon, or are we talking about a walk around the park? Like, what's the... Yeah, so you want to go to the sweet spot sort of in the middle, yeah. you know, and, and this is aerobic. You don't have to do this killer stuff, but, you know, so you're panting but you're not like dying okay 150 to 220 minutes a week wow so you can work that in it's not that much no when you break that down you know it's 30 minutes a day yeah so you, if anybody could do that take a fast walk for 30 minutes yeah or something else if you know there are problems and this is one thing we're going to get to is like the the things that over 50 women have to think about and a lot of injuries you know, over a lifetime, they start to just pop up and you go, oh, but my hip hurts. You know, yeah. you start to talking about my hip really, or my knees, or my back, or my yeah. something hurts right. when I walk. Everyone says walking is so simple. Okay, we'll find another thing. Maybe you have a bike you can get on and just go around, you know, the neighborhood or wherever. Or, or maybe a gym works for you. Maybe you can go do some laps in the pool. You know, just find something that works with your body's state. Because we do accumulate these things over the years. And, yeah. and I, do, I know that women, you know, they'll sometimes not want to say, but when I ask, you know, more deeply, it's like, yes, it really hurts because I've had this back injury that I just try to keep, you know, ignore, but it really right. holds me back. Yeah. So, yeah, very, be sensitive to yourself. And that's really my big message for women is you have to love yourself yeah. into being well. You can't beat up on yourself. Because that's just, it's just destructive in, in all ways. So, and we tend to do that. And I think we, we tend to do that starting really young. We just ignore the pain, ignore the yeah. Pain, push. Yeah. Through. Um, you know, and I, I, we start young with that and then we take it with us into our whole lives. And yeah. We, we have not solved anything. Right. Um, and that's the culture too, right? Suck yeah. it up. You know, right, right. And, but honestly, it's miserable if you just keep doing that. You know, it's not like saying don't have any discipline, but it's saying don't make yourself do something that's hurting. You know, find another way. Yeah, yeah. right. So how do you, so when when you are working with your clients who are who are you know post menopause or getting older, and you are dealing with a really long period of time in which they had a bad habit or they did something that wasn't helpful. How do you get them to think about shifting things and altering their lifestyle? And where do you start? What do you focus on? What do you tell them when they're feeling like they can't do it? Yeah, we start with the smallest thing possible. Okay. Smallest, smallest, because we have to create that sense of win and control. Like I can control myself by winning. Yeah. And literally the smallest thing possible is maybe just like take a fish oil supplement okay. every day. Or, you know, because I ask them, what do you, what can we do? And we'll put out a, an array of things, you know, what do you feel like? What do you feel 90% sure that you could do? Yeah. Like, pre, like almost nothing could get in your way on this one. Right. And do those. And, and the ability to just get that confidence up. Yeah. You start with taking official capsule pretty soon. You're getting to, yeah, I'm going to walk a mile and a half because I'm, I'm feeling better. And then, yeah, I'm going to, you know, skip that dessert that I usually have because I'm feeling more in control. You know, they, it just grows. The confidence yeah. grows. The desire grows. You just start, start the tiniest yeah. little thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such good wisdom. And, you know, um, and for anyone who's watching this, you can watch every health chat that we've recorded. You could watch every talk in the health means library. Um, and I think you should, I have, 
um, <laughs> and, and almost, almost all of them. And, oh. um, and every single one of them has this message. And at this point, you know, I've heard it so many times and I want to hear our audience to keep hearing it, that you, you're just not getting there with hate. You're not getting there with self-loathing. You're not getting there with judgment. You're not mm-hmm. getting there with trying to, you know, tear your life down and rebuild it. It really is slowly, patiently, one step at a time with a lot of self-care and a lot of yeah. self-love. And yeah. that's such good advice and it's such universal advice. Yeah. And, and that, isn't it true too? We always think everyone else has it all, all together. Yeah. But we're all struggling. Every yeah. single one of us has the demons. So you know, don't feel bad about yourself because you're not perfect. Like, oh, you think they're perfect. They're not. They're struggling too. Yeah. So if you can give yourself some slack and just go, hey, we're all just part of this thing trying to figure it out, you know? Yeah. And be kind to everybody, yourself, everybody. Yeah. yeah. That's great advice. Um, Maureen, thank you so much for joining us. This is a great conversation. Your conversation with Max was really a pleasure I invite everyone who's watching this to please go. It's in the featured talk section on the homepage of Health Means, healthmeans.com. Um, and Maureen Gary has has her entire uh, summit in there now. So you can actually watch all of the conversations. Yep, the first summit's in there, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, thank you for joining our Health Means library. And we're so excited to be able to provide this as a resource for people. Thank you for having me in there. I'm excited to be part of the Health Means family. It's great. Yeah. You guys are doing great work. I really appreciate being being affiliated with you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to sign off. Take care. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.